Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Ruth Gotian, and welcome once again to another week of the Mentor Projects Optimizing Success. I am so excited to have everybody. And once again, we have incredible guests, including one who has pulled yet another all-nighter, like he's back in college, to be with us again from the other side of the pond. So um, we're having some people coming in and out. But I wanted to continue the discussion that we were having last week about developing and building relationships, what is very commonly known as networking. But the networking sounds kind of slimy, and we're more about developing relationships and developing relationships over time. And I think this really struck a chord with a lot of people because we've been getting a lot of feedback from people and a lot of communication, so much that we just had to continue the conversation. Now, just yesterday, I got a text from a colleague at another institution saying she's putting some contests together. She needs, she needs some judges. She needs some speakers who fit these criteria. Do I know of anyone? And I was able to give her a list of half a dozen people. And she said, well, how do you know these people? I said, well, these are relationships that have literally developed over time. And these are people who I have known that I've met at some very interesting places because for me, it's all about finding interesting people, finding people from different industries, connecting with people, even connecting with my competitors, one who was here before, and I'm hoping she's able to log back on. And it's about building that trust and being kind and developing that relationship. And I think after you have that foundation, you have to give more than you ever receive. And once you can do that and build a relationship, it flows. And the reason so many of us, we actually, most of us know each other, it's all through these relationships that have been built and have grown over time. And maybe we can tell you a little bit about how they have grown over time. So I'm hoping everyone can introduce themselves and, um, these are really high achievers and people who have worked with high achievers. And I'm hoping we can just have this conversation, explain how we all know each other, what we are known for, what is our, what we're trying to do. And I'm going to call you out again the way I see you on my screen, starting with our favorite government attorney, Bradford Kane. can't hear you, Brad. <laughs> now I'm not muted. Now you're not muted. Greetings. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Bradford Kane. Um, these days I am the author of a book, and this time it's actually in book form. Yes, it's not just a cardboard cutout. Uh, there are actually pages um, called Pitchfork Populism, 10 Political Forces That Shaped an Election and Continue to Change America. It stems from my background, which is in mostly in government, but also in the private sector, nonprofit sector. But I worked in uh, Congress and in California state government, a number of things like that. And uh, now, obviously, very uh, focused on where America is and where America is going. The, the book also deals with the future. Thank you, Brad. And Brad and I met at a conference, which is where a lot of us have met each other, the same conference. Janice, who are you and what do you do? I'm Janice Lentz. I am the CEO of Hearing Access and Innovations, and I work to help make the world accessible for people with hearing loss. And behind me is a New York City taxi that I helped to bring the induction loop um, technology um, in taxis. And I actually brought this from England to the United States. Um, the, the technology was here, but not in taxis. And I'm also a traveler who's traveling to every country in the world. And I've been to 194 countries, territories, and unrecognized nations. How many interesting people have you met along the way? I find everybody interesting. I mean, literally the taxi project happened from my taxi driver in London who was explaining the technology. I've never saw it before. And we had this entire um, conversation about how he could continue working because of the technology. And if I hadn't spoken to my taxi driver, I would have never known about it. 
and I would have never brought it. So I find everybody interesting. As long as you have a story and you're nice, I'm happy and you're to you're kind. Talk. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Donna Griffin. We can't hear you. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Donna Griffin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Eldera. Um, we built a platform, an intergenerational platform that connects vetted mentors who are at least 60 years young with kids virtually for story time, conversation, and help with schoolwork and activities. Um, so that's what we do. We, we want to reconnect generations because we believe that we're weaving the fabrics of, of that village idea globally will help us solve a lot of the societal issues that we deal with right now. And a uh, fun fact is I was born and raised in Transylvania by my grandparents, hence my- um, You were raised by your grandparents. I was raised by my grandparents, yeah, 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 in Transylvania, Romania. So yeah, I'm not a vampire, sorry, <laughs> but uh, I get that question. And thank you so much for having me here. I absolutely love joining these conversations. Thank you. We got such a kick when you were on last time and, and we had a follow-up conversation and we, we really connected with that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Dwayne Allen Thomas sounds like an actor, but he's actually a lawyer. <laughs> we can't hear you, Dwayne. <laughs> the fact that you couldn't hear me killed every single one of those jokes I told. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, I am coming, I've decided to turn off the virtual background because you, so you can't see through me. And uh, other things um, besides being a lawyer, I do write um, sometimes, I write for psychology today. Um, I've started a bar exam tutoring program and um, I do that every once in a while as well. And uh, that's gonna be it because I'm still having video problems. <laughs> And people have heard this, uh, Dwayne and I, he was my first friend at a conference where we met. And because it was our first time attending the conference, our name tags were a different color. So you can tell who the, the rookies were. And so those of us with those <laughs> blue tags just connected to each other. That was that yeah. common link that we had. Yeah. Dr. Susan, who was quoted this week for the comments she made last week. She's a, a social me media maven this week. <laughs> you know, it was just so wonderful to see that, that people out there are appreciating this and really learning things and, and quoting it. It's what we're saying is noteworthy. And that's like, I was so touched. And uh, I wrote a thank you earlier today. I'm not really a LinkedIn person, but I'm getting better at it. So thank you so much. And I'm, whoever wrote that, and I'm sorry for uh, mm -hmm. the late response. So. I'm Dr. Susan Burnstone, and I actually have spent my career helping to transform lives, and I do this in many different ways. I am a therapist, psychotherapist, family therapist. I've had an independent practice. I've worked in agencies, and I'm also, my latest thing that I'm doing is forming a group, actually, for people um, that is a really safe and interesting place and community. It's a therapeutic community for it's going to be for both women and men. I think initially we're starting it for women, but it's really for high achievers and people that are really suffering, but they look like they're great on the outside, how we talked about imposter syndrome. So it's really a group for people who are dealing with those kinds of issues. What I also do is I am a television producer and host, and I transform lives using the platform. And Janice, when you were saying how you just love to talk to people and hear about their story, well, when I meet people, I just want to get them in a studio or now in Zoom and tell their story on my television talk show. So I've like met people, the guy giving out the tickets in the movie theater when we used to go to the movies, remember those days? <laughs> I, I like find out information like, oh my goodness, can you be on my show? So I find everybody's stories really interesting. And then I, I, I do conversations and tell their stories. And the other thing that I'm really happy to be involved with is I'm producing a show for The Mentor Project. And I am having conversations with mentors and talking about really neat stuff and getting it out there to people and kids that would not normally have access to an unbelievable array of mentors as well as information. And we're starting in Brooklyn, New York, where I am. 
and we're gonna, our goal is to go really across the entire country. So I'm excited and Debbie's on the call and thank you Debbie and everybody else for that. And uh, for many of you that are gonna be on or have been on as well. And thank you Ruth so much. For thank creating you. This too. Thank you. Now off to California, Jana Marie Tutalman. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank goodness. I'm on a different <laughs> computer, so I had to get it all figured out. Thank you, Ruthie, for having me. I've been watching. I'm so excited about this. Um, I'm uh, thrilled that you're doing something like this. As you and I both know, as we were mentors for uh, most of our adult life, right, uh, we have um, mentored hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students. And now we're moving into, both of us, a new category of working with leadership. So what I'm doing is um, considering myself a catalyst for clarity, and I'm working with uh, entrepreneur women. I mean, I do, like uh, she just said, I work with men too, but mostly I'm setting this up for women who are in leadership or entrepreneurship who are struggling. And what I've found in my research last couple of years since I retired from the university after 38 years is when people are really struggling, what they're struggling with is their core values, their guiding principles, and their convictions, and they're not aligned with them. They're doing things completely out of alignment with what they really believe, and that's why they're struggling and why they're not happy. So I'm working with uh, women in leadership on that particular topic, and I have a um, technique called the crystal clear technique to get them clarity on exactly what it is they want how they can get it and get them there. So I'm the guide and the mentor that helps them get to that place. I love it. And I've known Jana for, God, almost 25 <laughs> years. So the, we ran programs, we were actually competitors. And we turned that competition into friendship. <laughs> so we decided while the programs were competitors, the people running them were actually friends. Um, so that, that's how that blossomed, which was great. Right. Now, let us stay in California. Liana, hello. Hi, how are you? I'm so excited to be here. This is such a big group. Look We're at what so you've created. We're so excited to have you. <laughs> Debbie, look, Doug, Debbie and Ruth, look at what you've created. This is fantastic. So um, what am I doing? I, I'm starting something that has been... Um, that I've been going pregnant with for a very, very long time. And uh, uh, Debbie, had it not been for you and this community, this, this birthing would have most probably happened in another few years from now. And now it's happening on Sunday. So I've, uh, I'm, I'm a leadership coach. I'm an image therapist. So I believe that the way we present ourselves in our second skin, our clothing, really has a lot to do with what's happening on the inside of who we are. And I've been doing this for about 40 years. I do it in four or five languages all over the world. And I've been, um, I've been mentoring a lot on a code that we all have. So Jen was talking about the values that we carry and you know the standards that we live by. And I've always recognized there is a code by which people who thrive rather than survive, but which they live by, but they are not always aware of it. It's like the water that they swim in. So we swim in a certain kind of water, which we're not unaware of. And then I tried to crystallize it out. And one of the things that I've done for many years is, is embodiment work with Aikido and, you know, and Aikido and the samurais live by a certain code. So I'm now taking the samurai, 12th century samurai code, the Bushido code, and the Wonder Woman code, and I'm putting them together. And this weekend on Sunday, I'm presenting it in a conversation on Zoom, and I'm so, so excited about it because I want to take people from warrior, which connotes that you are actually needing an armor and you're going to war, to Wonder Woman, to taking it, you know, this is who I am, these are my assets, these are the things that I'm not so good at, and just showing up in all your authenticity. And I'm so excited. <laughs> so if you guys want to join, come, uh, let us know. We'll, we'll tell you, we'll give you the link. It's going to be on LinkedIn. So it's super, super excited because this is also going into the Middle East, all over Jordan and Egypt. And yes. Wow. And so I'll, I'll say more about that. Yeah. 
It's awesome. very excited. Very, very awesome. exciting. Now I see another Californian. I think she's still in California. Who's super excited? Pamela O'Leary. Hi, uh, I am in San Mateo, California. Um, I, I just quick quick intro, I guess. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Um, I work at Corn Ferry doing diversity and inclusion work, and I'm writing a book about my empowerment journey and how I've learned to love myself as a as a you know. I've, my, my entire career has been dedicated to empowering women in underrepresented communities, and I've been struggling with how to empower myself in doing that work. So nice, happy to be here. Thank you. And now I think we have another Californian. Where's Susie Katz? Hey, Susie. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Sheltering in Blodega Bay, California. That's what they call it. It's 30 mile an hour winds up there right now. Uh, gushing up to 40. Um, I'm actually in Bodega Bay. Um, I'm a photographer and uh, I spend most of my time around my educational nonprofit called Photo Wings, which I've discussed in this uh, group. I know most of you here. Uh, and we utilize photography to help teach people how to think. We have a lot of interesting partnerships around the world. And Susie has, she's had a TED talk and she has the most incredible photos I have ever seen, bar none. Incredible. Neil. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hello, I'm, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Neil Cummins. Um, I'm an astronomer, astrophysicist, and my latest effort is to get young people interested in science. And <clears throat> this may sound a little bit strange, which it is, uh, but the way we're doing that is we're using, uh, well, as I, I wrote several books uh, based on asking what if questions, like what if the moon didn't exist? Or what if the earth had two moons? I create world, alternative world that are physically uh, plausible, uh, but slightly different than ours. And <clears throat> what I'm trying to do now is get young people interested in asking those kinds of questions and exploring the answers. You ready for this? Uh, using Minecraft. And um, so we are, uh, with a collaborator at the University of Illinois, we are creating these these alternative worlds in Minecraft and encouraging, you know, young people, shall we say, Minecraft players to explore them and see how they're different from our world. And, uh, well, we'll see what happens. And that was, that was, uh, that partnership was based on um, a relationship that developed at a conference. I remember you mentioned last time. That's right. And it, and it actually came from Renaissance. Nice. <laughs> well, if we're going to talk about out of this world, then that's a natural progression to Dr. Charlie Camarda. <laughs> hey, Charlie. Hey, how you doing, Ruth? I had such trouble getting in on my computer for some reason. Outlook was messing me up. So I'm on my phone. Well, you can and... get to the moon, but you can't get on Zoom, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, not tonight. I was on all day, but I wasn't able... But I'm also watching, you know, Elon Musk did a fantastic job. And so in the background, I have Elon Musk is, uh, they're trying to launch their Starship Hopper. They're going to do a little hop test in Boca Chica, Texas. Well, tell everyone who you are, Charlie, and why you're so obsessed with watching Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, uh, I'm, uh, well, I thought they knew me. I thought this crew well, knew me. I, most people know you, but we're, we're on Facebook Live and it's being recorded and people all over oh, the world oh, are watching. Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> I'm a retired astronaut. I worked at NASA my whole life for about 46 years. I flew in 2005. We were the first launch after the uh, Columbia accident. And now I spend most of my time doing a little consulting, writing books, and, um, and I have a nonprofit uh, on a, at the Epic Education Foundation trying to transform the way we educate our young people and trying to democratize education, make it um, available, affordable for all students everywhere. 
Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and I'm glad you're back on earth with us. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. Now, we can't talk about educating young people without talking to Hannah Halper. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm an early childhood educator, and I um, am certified in mindfulness education. And um, I actually have been mentoring my students as my Head Start students as they progress through the system. And um, I've developed relationships with their parents at an early age and with them. And so it's been mentoring more one-to-one. -one. And um, I uh, just this summer, I've been uh, in the pottery studio. It opened up uh, social distancing. So I've been making a lot of vessels and bowls. And I actually just came back from a very small um, writing workshop in New Hampshire with Joyce Maynard and all outside socially distanced. And because um, I'm beginning to write a book about my mother who was a ceramic artist. So lots going on. Nice, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. Dr. Bruce Wiley. Yes, I've I've never been anywhere near space. Um, <laughs> I'm a I'm a big fan of the uh, Mentor Project, and I'm a big fan of your show, uh, Ruth, as well as uh, Dr. Bernstone's show as well, and and uh, a lot of the work of all the people on this um, uh, currently on right now. So I, I always learn a lot when I listen to you. I'm a professor, journalist, uh, computer modeler. Um, and public health person. That is the most un, that was, that's the, the simplest introduction I've ever heard <laughs> for someone who does what you do. Why don't you, can you expand a little bit on what you're doing and what you do? Um, so, yeah, so I guess I do. Um, I, uh, I cover uh, health and healthcare and science for Forbes. Um, so I write a lot about um, medicine, health um, issues, uh, I also run a center that does uh, computer modeling work. Um, so we help um, address different types of global health and public health issues uh, by running computer simulations, uh, helping decision makers make decisions. Um, and I also teach as well. Wow, that's great. <laughs> and I highly encourage you to read his Forbes articles on COVID. They are fantastic. Next, Sarah. You're on mute. There you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. Such a joy and a pleasure uh, to be spending some time with you. I'm Sarah Milby. Ruth, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join. I am an entrepreneur, and I currently run a company called Valor Performance. I started the company in 2016, uh, and we do leadership and performance coaching, all delivered through technology. Uh, so we're all virtual. It's a technology-enabled company. We work with technology and software companies, predominantly managers, executives, high potentials. We work with financial services companies, and now emerging more into healthcare, working with physicians, giving them the leadership development, professional development that they so crave. Uh, so it is an honor to be here, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Now, why don't you tell everyone who some of your coaches are, the types of people? Because uh, that fits in with this group very well. Good point. So 50% of our coaches are Olympians and pro athletes who then go through what we call Valor Academy, which is our training program for them to become certified uh, in coaching. And then the other 50% have advanced degrees, PhD, masters in performance psychology and related fields. Uh, and we're doing more with a lot of our clients now, we're doing more organizational development and design, uh, which is also really exciting. So we're creating, working with individuals and high performance routines uh, with one-on-one -on -one coaching, high performance uh, processes and systems, and then also cultures, so. 
Fantastic. Sarah, you and Charlie need to chat offline because he works a lot with high performance teams. And the way I Sarah, could, oh, go ahead. I could, use, I could use a coach though. <laughs> so Biotic. Biotic. the way Sarah and I met, um, so I write for Forbes as well. And I, I interview high achievers and elite high achievers. Those are who I study. And I actually interviewed an Olympic champion who I later found out was a coach for Valor and he introduced me to Sarah and that's just how the whole thing snowballed. So it's all about developing those relationships. Now I'm hoping he's still staying awake because he is pulling another all-nighter for us straight from the UK. Andy. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have actually, Sarah, I've just been to, to, to the, the hardest thing about doing these is bridging the gap between about 10 o'clock at night when I'm normally winding down and one o'clock in the morning when I join you guys. And so tonight I decided to do some podcast editing because uh, I'm launching my podcast in a couple of weeks. So I was editing an interview I did with an um, Olympic bronze medalist. Uh, who's gone into executive coaching, funnily enough. Uh, oh, wow. so, if you <laughs> need any more, Sarah's got a whole bank of them. I was just going to say, <laughs> yeah. that yeah, sounds absolutely. very interesting. Well, I, I, well I, I, I've known Goldie for, for quite a few years. It, what a great name for an Olympic medalist, Goldie. <laughs> I, unfortunately, it was a bronze, but um, I met her when I did, uh, I, I ran a session for the British Athletes Commission on, on the importance of networks and relationships when you take your career outside sports when you retire um but because it wasn't so much about her medal in 2014 she was the team gb captain uh, in the european championships and we had just the most amazing championships one record number of, of medals and she was famous for giving a speech to all of the athletes that really inspired them on and i wanted to know how you take a group of uh, and ruth this would really fit into your um, you know, your area with, with high performance, how do, you, how do you take a group of high performing individuals and make them a team? Because when you look at these great athletics teams, it's the team performances. You know, the Brits, we're a small country, but we excel, you know, above our weight. We punch above our weight in athletics. And particularly when you look at relay, for example, which is a team sport, but you take a team of individual performers and you get them to work together. So that was part of my, my goal with that interview. So as soon as you said that, you know, I thought it was quite, quite uh, funny timing with having edited that tonight. Now tell us what you, what you do when you're not up at 1am. <laughs> when I'm not up at 1am. Um, so I'm, I'm a, an expert in professional relationship strategy. Uh, now you see why he's here? <laughs> and now you see why I'm here and why I've agreed to come back again this week. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been involved in networking and professional relationships for 21 years now. Uh, ran a, a business network for the first seven or eight of those. Since then, I, I'm a speaker, uh, speak all over the world. I'm on the board of the Professional Speaking Association in the UK, and I'm one of the, I think, 26 recipients of our Award of Excellence. Uh, I, I mentor, uh, and, and obviously with, with the changes we're experiencing now, a lot of my focus is shifting to mentoring people individually, and, and my mentoring clients are global as well, uh, and, the, and an author. Um, we talked last week about my fourth book, which came out uh, in paperback about three weeks ago uh, and came out at the end of May, written in lockdown, um, Connected Leadership. And Ruth just received a draft today of my fifth book, which has gone off to the publisher today as well, called Just Ask, which is all about vulnerability and the importance of asking for help. Good luck with those. We can't wait. Thank you. <laughs> Now you're our, you're our resident expert on this, so you're gonna you're gonna Charlie. chime in if we're saying something that's wrong. Charlie, <laughs> well, can you hear us? Charlie. Yep, there we go. So Charlie, you've spoken many times. We've been on many zooms for these different programs we're on together. Am I bothering Elon Musk? No, no, no. I I think he's. I think they've scrubbed. I'm sorry. <laughs> um. You've spoken before about your Friends of Charlie network. Yes. Can you, can you talk about that? Because I think that's so apropos for this discussion. Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book. Uh, only I'm not near as far along as the, the other folks on the line here in my, um, in Imp my writing. Imposter um, syndrome, I'm, Charlie? Yeah, I'm an ADD uh, adult. 
and and so but um i'm writing a book on high performing teams and um and throughout my career you know i i flew after the accident and so i watched how we failed miserably and when we try to understand these problems when you have these very uh complex technical problems uh there's no deterministic solution and so how do you create a network of people and make sure the information gets passed to all the right people in a team of teams kind of way to make sure that the right people um have inputs at the right time and so a lot of my success is because I've been at NASA so long and worked with um, such a large group of people that my close friends that are on the Friends of Charlie Network and my colleagues that I use are the subject matter experts that are not only the people with the know-how, but knowing these people, knowing their integrity, uh, their willingness to uh, speak up when they see something wrong, be able to criticize people, um, uh, work in teams in a psychologically safe way, and people that will tell you that they don't know something when they don't know something and point you to the right people. And so creating those, uh, those right networks, and so what we're trying to do is see if we can create a, a psychosocial um, um, ecosystem where it's, you're able to get to just the right person. You know, if, if um, some of the folks on the line probably have read the book, Team of Teams, Stanley McChrystal, um, basically talks about uh, changing the way we fight the enemy in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and um, how he went about doing that using this Team of Teams approach. Well, we do something very similar on the technical side of the house. And so that's, um, that's what I spend my spare time in when I'm not doing um, education stuff. Nice. Now, Jana, can you hear us? So Jana and I would go, uh, we would be at the same conferences and often we'd have to recruit the next generation of physician scientists. We were constantly looking for diamonds in the rough. And Jana has this skill. I wish we could just bottle it up because she can talk to anybody, anybody about anything and make them feel like they are the most important person in the room. And every time I would go to these events, I said, I need to put my Jana face on because I really needed to embody her. And I'm an extrovert, but I needed to embody her to be able to constantly do that because she is the master. What's your secret sauce, Jana? Oh, you're on mute, Jana, you're on mute. De Debbie, are you able to unmute her? Oh, did she just disappear? She shut her video off. I'm hoping she could join us. It's on her end, sorry. Okay, I think I see she got her sound on, Jenna. No, lost it again. I don't know where I... <laughs> Hello. You could do it, Jana, you can do it. Jenna, if you're on your phone, just swipe left. If you're on a, it seems like you're on a phone when you when you swipe, it'll take you away from the camera. Jenna, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you, okay? We'll get back to you, Sarah. You're on. Tell us how you cultivated this group of incredible coaches. Jenna, we'll get back to you. Sarah, how you got this group of incredible coaches and how you pulled them together. And um, you essentially built this company in four years and we're in the middle of the pandemic and you have these big name clients and big name coaches. How did you manage to do all that? One step at a time, uh, one conversation at a time. I, for me, I'm just very curious about people. I'm curious, end of sentence. Uh, and so I genuinely started by just asking a lot of questions because of just my hunger to learn and understand. So it was as simple as, for me, I had personal experience as a athlete where I was connected to a performance coach who gave me a lot of the 
mental skills that then I learned as I worked in all sectors were very uh, translatable and appropriate and vital, frankly. Uh, and so for me, it was just going to a couple coaches who had have worked with top athletes um, and asking them, what about applying this into corporate? And it was just from a place of seeking to understand. And then it started to kind of build upon that. Um, I, the other thing that I'd say is crucial in the story of how I started the company was also in, because of the curiosity, um, and I'd end up hearing about their story and what they were currently working on. And just instead of thinking about it as what they could do for me, I came from a place of how I could help them. Uh, so there's so many examples of individuals where it started by me saying, you know who you should talk to? Oh my gosh, I have something that's right up your alley with no ask in mind. It was just seeding and building those relationships. Uh, and, and honestly, I think about some of our clients now, they are, it, I take business very personally. I mean, I, it's, I'm a founder, so maybe that's normal, but um, these are people that I want in my life whether Valor and their company's partnership exists or not. Uh, we just have a strong foundation of trust. And I think that's uh, part of how it all began was just the mutual respect and trying to help one another. I love that. And that's a lot of what Susan was saying last week as well. Love it. Jenna, we're good? Can you hear me now? We can hear you and we can see you. Can you share your secret sauce with us? Well, after that wonderful introduction and just disappearing to the ethers, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm not on my own computer. Um, my secret sauce, I don't know that, uh, that there's a secret to it. Um, I, everyone I meet and everyone I stand in front of, I have a feeling about them. And um, I think the way I resonate with people is that I'm present. I'm always like present in the moment with that person. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, people call it tricks and people write books about it, but I look people in the eye when I talk to them and I talk to them from who I really am authentically. And I think that people feel back that they can be honest and open with me too. And everywhere I've gone, in fact, my entire life, no matter where I'm sitting, someone will come up and tell me their life story. And I've never really understood why, but it's some sort of magical thing. So that could be the secret sauce. I don't know. <laughs> but my, uh, when I met my husband, he said, you know, will I ever be alone with you? Because we were never able to go anywhere without people ending up telling their life story. So um, I think it has to do with being open, honest, looking people in the eye. I mean, you know, very simple things, but apparently not so simple because a lot of people aren't taught those things. And so I think I come across and su successfully that way because it's just who I am. And, you know, that's what has led me to, you know, into entrepreneurship after leaving higher education is I saw so much of people, you know, being up when they talk, you know, we're in academics, right? So <laughs> there's a whole lot of looking up and never looking you in the eye. And uh, it was an, an unusual in that situation because I would make people look me in the eye. And I developed relationships with them, even the scientists, no offense to scientists, but um, you know, they're always looking this way or that way and never really at you. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that's secret sauce or not, but um, I think my, I vibrate at authentic and honest, open and loving and tell me what's happening. And I think that that, that works, it works for me. And um, I think that's why I've been successful with some clients. Amen. And I have to tell you, I, I've, I've walked around with, with Jana and getting from the elevator to the front desk can take 45 minutes because she is talking to everyone who she meets along the way and really developing relationships. She'll remember their name the next time she sees them. So can I, can I just say, Ruth, that I think yes. there's, there's, there's a key word that relates to both what Sarah and Jana said without it actually being said. And I don't think we mentioned this word last week either, and that's listening. Yes. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of people fail. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about for years is that we always talk about listening to people. Um, and, and in fact, we should listen for people. 
mm-hmm. because when we listen, Co- Stephen Covey talks about active listening. And he says how our habit is to already be um, coming up with our response while the other person is still talking. Um, and if you listen for people, you take yourself out of the equation. You actually tune into to what they're saying and you think about, you know, sometimes they just want to be listened to. Sometimes you can help them and support them. And that's where Sarah gets the opportunity to make connections. It's where Jana uh, gets the opportunity to, to make a real genuine connection because she's tuning in. Uh, and, and I think that we didn't mention it last week, I don't think, but that word listen is, is perhaps one of the most underrated in relationship building. How do you think we can do it better, Andy? Practice. <laughs> it, it's, I'll be honest, um, it, it's one of my biggest weaknesses, this, this whole thing about taking yourself out of the equation, and I've known it for years. Classic mm-hmm. example, if someone tells me about their holiday, I'll start telling them about when I went to that place. And and I I because we, we want to take things onto the ground we're comfortable with. And the only way you get beyond that, if it's not natural to you, is practice. It's it's recognizing the voice in your head that's jumping mm. in and quietening it. Uh, and, and I don't think there's there's a, there's a, a, an easy way around it if it's not natural to you. You just have to keep kicking yourself and pinching yourself every time you do it. Uh, and step by step you get better. And Andy, as, as the expert in, in our room where it happens, in our Zoom room, um, what are some of the other things we could do better in order to develop meaningful relationships with people? Well, I mean, taking the, the sort of the bigger picture rather than just the initial conversation, you asked me last week for, for a biggest mistake, and I, I, I shared sort of one, one example with you. The one that I, I didn't share but I most commonly do is, is follow up. This is where what most people don't do is actually follow up and we invest time in interesting conversations. And, you know, we might fire off an email and we think we've got our job ticked, but we've got to build that relationship. I I talk about when when we use the term building a network, people immediately think of meeting more people, forgetting the people we already have in our network. And I've identified seven stages of, of professional relationship. Uh, and the first stages are recognize, know, and like. And your networks are populated with people who are stuck at those levels. Uh, and I, when I do workshops, uh, particularly since everything's on Zoom now and I'm using online polling, I, I show people my model and I say, where do you think your mean level of relationships is and where do you think it should be? And the mean level on every exercise is between three and three and a half, which is around like. Between mm-hmm. like and trust. Mm-hmm. The, the, the level people want to aim for is level five, which is uh, support. So five is support, six is advocate. Uh, advocate. Um, and so rather than worrying about meeting more people, develop the relationships, nurture the relationships with people you've met. So when you first meet someone, follow up. Um, I, I, someone shared something on one of my workshops years ago, I, I, well over a decade ago, never found the original source. So maybe by now I can claim it. Um, but it was 24, 7, 30, and it works. You follow up after 24 hours. And some people think that that looks needy, but I point out we're not talking about dating. Uh, you follow up again within a week and you follow up again uh, after 30 days and it's three different two-way touch points and if you can get those three touch points in then you've built a wall around the outside of that circle those seven levels Uh, and then you can focus on taking people through that journey and it's just about little touch points i saw this and i thought of you uh, a thank you card, a referral. You know, Sarah was talking about connecting people to others. All of those deepen and deepen and deepen the relationships uh, allied with social media. Social media is so unrelated. Uh, sorry, it's so un- underrated. It's a fantastic way to stay insight in mind. You know, it's easy to forget. With we met what two months ago, if yeah. that, and and we accelerated our relationship very rapidly. Uh, and social media was a key part of that because we like and, and comment on each other's updates a lot. That's true. Uh, and it just keeps you front of mind all the time. So it's so a follow up and nurturing the relationship is key. I like that. 24 730. I wrote that 24, down. 24 730. With just to follow up on what Andy was saying, um, 
if you want to um, listen more effectively, you can ask follow-up questions to whatever someone's talking about because people tend to talk about themselves a lot. So if you're listening to what they're saying, there might be something that causes some confusion or something you're, not, something you're concerned about or something you want to know more about, and you just keep asking questions to learn more about what it is they're talking about. However, the, um, the interesting thing is when you do that, you do sometimes have to inject yourself in the conversation because a lot of times people won't ask you questions about you and to the point where I have some friends who, uh, who said that they, they don't know anything about me because they never bothered to ask me any questions about me. I know you love hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> there was, a, go there was a famous, there was a famous study. Uh, I can't remember which book I read it in. I think it's been in a couple famous study where researchers sat, um, one of their team next to a stranger on, on a flight and they spent the whole flight, uh, asking questions about the, the passenger next to them. And then when that passenger got off, there was another member of the research team at the foot of the stairs, and they would say, excuse me, can we just ask you a few questions about your flight? Tell us about the person that, that sat next to you. What were they like? Were they interesting? Oh, they were fascinating. Tell us something about them. And, and, and the key was that that researcher could not even tell that person their name. But because they'd asked about them the whole time, wow. they thought they were fascinating. Dale Carnegie said the sweetest sound to any man is the sound of his own name. Um, absolutely key. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with Andy. Um, in fact, he posted something earlier today on LinkedIn, and I commented on it. I think most people don't follow up. And I had a situation where I wanted to meet um, a very prominent um, civil rights um, advocate. I mean, very, very famous. Um, and I met him at a book signing and he said, sure, I'll contact him. And I would patiently and politely contact him, never responded. Follow up, never responded. And finally on the fourth um, email, he responded and he, and he said he finally he set up the meeting and he wrote he wrote the recommendation that I was hoping he would write, but he said he doesn't um, respond right away intentionally because he's not going to invest his time to meet with someone or write a letter if they don't invest the time and really care. And so and he said and I I followed up on, to be persistent but not to a point of annoying, and it, which is a fine line. But I find most people, uh, my mother used to have an expression like um, follow through is important in tennis and golf, um, which is an old thing, but like it's definitely true. And I find most of, especially as an advocate, most people don't follow through. And I think most organizations, especially if you have an issue, they are hoping you don't follow through, right? Because they want the problem to go away. And so I had read um, an article about the um, Metropolitan Museum of Art um, when it was run by Philippe de Montebello, that his goal was just to get problems go away. And so I called regularly um, and spoke to his secretary uh, or assistant, Susie, and to a point she knew my name when I would call and I recognized my voice. And they finally implemented the access just to make me go away. Right? And sometimes <laughs> that's what you have to do. And that's the FDA had the same thing. When I needed hearing aids to become compatible with the FCC, I kept calling. And I think sometimes most people are afraid to do that because it comes across as pushy, especially if you're a woman. As a man, nobody would say anything. And I think for a lot of women, it's very hard to not feel aggressive. But if you don't follow through, people can just put it at the bottom of the pile. Right. I always follow through. You know, uh, yeah, I, I, first of all, Andy, hi, I'm Liana. I'm, I didn't meet you last week. Nice to meet you. Um, hi, Sarah. Sarah, I totally have curiosity as one of my highest values. And I love when, I love when you said that. And I think that there for women especially after what janet's just said you know there's a fine line the way women show up in curiosity because when we show up in curiosity we we're so excited i mean sarah i could just see the smile on your face and i can just imagine how you know how you how we be when we're with someone and 
What I've noticed is that because I move in and out of so many different cultures during the day, I move from German to Persian to Italian to American, and, and I notice that in different cultures, it's very, very different. And even in different cultures in the boardroom, being raised in Europe and now coming to America, I just find charm for a woman, one of the most beautiful attributes and having a charming conversation is much easier than being fierce. And so, and I find, I don't know if you guys find that or if you have anything that, you know, Andy, Andy, you're, you're living in London. Are you living in London? Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah, you speak something. a little bit to that? Because I do a lot of fierce feminine. And so feminine leadership, I believe, is, is truly missing, like from a place of, of grounding and what wisdom from, from a space of the feminine wisdom. You know, I'm not, uh, saying, I'm not saying to step back. I'm saying before you even get a seat at the table, feminine step. empowerment starts way before even walking into the boardroom. What's your, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? I think when I look at the British media uh, representation of women in business over the last two decades, it, it has consistently appalled me because the, 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 the way that we um, portray women in business on television is, is the bulldog. You know, it, it's got to be right. all about raw aggression, big shoulder pads. The, the, you know, we have The Apprentice here as well, unfortunately, and um, it, it, it's a classic example, the same with Dragon's Den, which um, I think it goes out of a different name in, in, in the States. Um, but, but they're always very hostile, aggressive role models. The female leaders I know in the UK, and I know a lot, I, I do a lot of work with women's networks, that's not them at all. They're assertive, absolutely. Uh, confident uh, on the face of it. You know, men and women, I think we both wear a mask to a large degree. Um, but that aggression is only there if needed. Um, I, I think you talk about the inquisitive nature that, that women bring to the table. Um, one of the interesting things I, find, I found is that when I speak to, to women's networks, I often share a model created by Ivan Meisner, Dr. Ivan Meisner, who founded BNI. Um, and, and Ivan wrote a book called Business, Networking and Sex. No, not that kind, which is the title of the book, about gender differences. And he, he, he has a process he calls VCP. Um, which he says is, is the process of a networking relationship. Visibility, then credibility, then profitability, and that's how you build it. And he says the difference between the genders is that what men do, and, and I often say masculine versus feminine rather than male versus female, because yes, I think exactly. we, yeah, we, all have, we all have a degree of each within us, and it's which comes out the stronger. But um, he says that the difference will be that the, the masculine energy or, or the man will go visibility, profitability. I see you. I see how you can help me. Let's deal with that and get to know each other afterwards. The, the feminine energy or the, or the female will say visibility then credibility let me get to know you first tell me about yourself how are you so what's bugging you how can i help you now are you really okay and and, and it, i do this on a flip chart and i just do arrows you know to to pee and again and again and again so to to, to see for credibility again and again and, and i'm always nervous when i do it as a man talking to a room of women but everyone's laughing because they recognize it and i and i always say that neither approach is right and we we have to get that but that balance between the two approaches um, and the masculine energy needs to rein itself in and, and get to invest in people and get to know people and have that inquisitive nature. The feminine energy needs to know when to ask for help and, and ask for, for themselves as and well. Have you read the book uh, in a different voice? Like no. Elegant? no. She talks a lot about this. She's a professor, yeah. I think at NYU and she talks about, um, this, this different approaches between men and women, and it has a lot to do with the way we were raised, right? The women were raised, we were more social on the playground while the boys were playing competitive sports, at least my generation was like that. Um, and that has a lot to do with how we grew up as adults.
Yeah. And I look at this in, in the new book, Just Ask, I, I look at the gender differences when it comes to vulnerability and asking for help. What interested me is I, I thought um, that men would be a lot worse. And it comes up in certain cases, but actually both genders have an issue with it at different times and in different environments with that vulnerability. A woman in the workplace will find it a lot harder to be vulnerable because of the expectations um, if she wants to succeed in, in, a, in a, particularly in a male-dominated environment. But I, I interviewed Joe Swinson, who was the leader of the Liberal Democrats in the UK last year, the, our third political party. Um, well, I should say our fourth now because the Scottish nationalists have, have overtaken them. Um, but, but Joe talked a lot about conditioning of boys and girls um, growing up and and you know, the, the whole different thing. And um, she told me about her son, uh, who was, I think, about five at the time, falling over and standing up and going, look, I didn't cry. You know, and this, this whole boys don't cry. And, and she and her husband looked at each other and said, well, where did he get that from? Because we didn't teach him that. You know, you should cry. You should let people know when you're hurt. But some from somewhere, he's picked up at a very young age, boys don't cry. Um, so there is um, there is conditioning, and it's very very hard to get away from that. And of course, we carry. You know, I, I'm talking to, to to a number of you know people who write for Psychology Today. So I, you know, I have to be very careful about presenting myself on a, as an expert on this stuff. But you know, a lot of the things we talk about are carried in from childhood. Very much so. I think it also has to do with your profession, Bruce. How often in, in your in your world do people say, "I don't know." Oh, <laughs> I know what Jan is thinking. <laughs> Bruce is muted. Bruce, I'm muted. Yeah, okay. I couldn't tell whether you were saying uh, Bruce or Ruth, but then I realized that you're the one Ruth here. So I'm not talking to myself. Talking to yourself, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a big it's a big problem in the medical profession, um, and I, uh, uh, I I I frequently relate a story, and I'm going to try to explain something now where basically. I got into an indirect debate with a cardiologist who was telling uh, a medical resident that you should never, ever admit that you don't know something. Um, because I had told the medical resident, you know, no problem. You know, just uh, we, we, if you don't know something, just, uh, just, just admit it even to the patient because the patient uh, wants to know, wants you to be honest and wants that honest relationship so you it's better actually if you tell the patient well i'm not sure, sure what's going on right now but let's try to figure it out together but i think one of the problems is uh in the profession there's this attitude that well if you admit that you don't know something then you'll lose credibility uh and you'll lose sort of this you know uh idea that you're like up on the pedestal or you know several rungs up the uh stairs but i think that's a very that's a that's a wrong attitude because you know what people are looking for is they're looking for uh, someone who's genuine and will be willing to tell them because if if you if if there's one slip up and you realize that hey that person doesn't really know what he or she is talking about then you can't trust that person going forward um, so we really need to change that and we need to be more honest about uh, you know, our I think uh, Bruce I think that that's like at the center, that's like the fulcrum, what you're talking about is the fulcrum that we're in, in this two, 2020. We are all seeking authenticity. We're all seeking more connection. We're all seeking more deeper, deeper connection. I was talking to my 15 year old granddaughter who says, you know, my friend, I want to talk to her, but she won't go deep. My 15 year old granddaughter says that. And, and the truth is that our, our communities, our society, whether it's Western or Middle Eastern or Eastern, we're not, we haven't been created from childhood to be as vulnerable and as transparent and as intimate, to build intimacy into me, you see. How do we do this now in a corporation where we all have to look really good and we have to look really strong? And I think it's, and I'm talking to a group of high achievers, so my call is always intimacy is the highest currency. Vulnerability is the highest currency. And even if I look bad, 
it doesn't matter because for the greater good, if I can be a stand into the community and say, look, I really don't know how this is going to work and I'm willing to try. There is a place where someone down the ladder can look at that and say, man, if she can do it and she's as fierce as she is in leading communities, then, then maybe I can step into the unknown with her and we can all try to figure it out together. Because if we won't show our wounds and our broken wings, we're never going to be able to unfurl them and soar, ever. Yep. So, you know, right. Liana, what you're talking about is so important in terms of knowing oneself also. And I wanted to relate that to an earlier topic. Um, the question was, how do we become better listeners? And I've been thinking a lot about this because I was, that was what I was doing for a long time. One of my jobs was to listen to people. And I too, uh, wherever I go, people tell me their life story. But one of the things in terms of, you know, when, when Andy was talking about uh, you ask somebody a question and then you immediately go into, oh, well, I did this, you know, and how do you stop yourself? One of the things I think is help, would be helpful and is helpful for people is if you think about what your own need is, because you might be an extrovert or an introvert or an ambivert, but like, what is your need in that moment? And to think about like, okay, what, what, what's my need? Do I like need to get charged by talking about myself? Well, then I'm not going to be a really good listener if I have a need to talk. If I sat and listened to people all day and it was all about them, then at night, it's very hard for me to then do that because I want to talk about myself. So I'm very careful about, and I think about, okay, well, what, what is my need right now? So then what, I'm, what am I going to do? And to think about, okay, I want to learn about this person. So I need to, I want to go into listening mode to then shift. So it's my, my, one of the pieces of advice I would say is to think about yourself and say, okay, where am I? What's my goal and what's going to enable me to then do that? Because I don't think we do that enough. We don't stop and just reflect on ourselves. And, and that would be the one piece is to think, one is what is your goal and are you in a place to do that? And then what do you need in order to do that mm -hmm. and to make a yeah, plan? It's, it's really amazing, actually, if you, you know, you talk about like, oh, trying to make a shift listening, but it's actually incredible how much you learn when you listen to other folks. I mean, you know, um, I, you know, I, I learn every day from what people tell me. I, I remember uh, when Liana told me that, hey, the, uh, the reflection of the light behind you is blinding and piercing everyone's retina. You might want to cover that up. And then I covered that up and then everyone remarked on that for the next several weeks. Hey, you're, you're not blinding everyone with your, <laughs> with your light back there. So, you know, it's the type I, of thing I want, Bruce, I want you to blind people with your amazing charm and wisdom and knowledge and passion and, and, and your clarity. Oh my, and your, and your humor. Wow. Not the damn light behind you. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, we are running. We ran out of time again, and I, I wanted to hear about networking in Congress because you know that's where it happens. So, Brad, you're going to have to kick us off with that next time because um, we are running out of time, and I don't want Andy to fall asleep on us. Um, I do want to tell you, for those of you who did the adult learning with me, those of us who are accommodators, we have a hard time, a harder time, listening because we're so busy talking. So um, just remember that. So that's why when you see, sometimes people ask me why I'm so quiet. I, um, I, I literally work at it, literally work at it so that I can hear what other people are saying because I know that could be an area of vulnerability for me, for a coach, right? So everyone, um, I want to end the discussion. If people want to hear more about you and hear of all the wonderful things that you are doing, where can they find you? Brad. That short, the, the title.com. Pitchforkpopulism.com. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Janice. Hearingaccess.com. Thank you. Maybe next time you'll tell everyone how you, um, how you uh, communicated with the President of the United States and the Queen of England, but that's for another time. <laughs> Andy. <laughs> It's andylopata.com, L-O-P-A-T-A. -A. Thank, thank you for inviting me back on. Um, I, I won't be on every week, but I'd love to come back every now and then in the future and join you guys. We would love to have you anytime you have insomnia. <laughs> <laughs>
Susie Katz. I posted the website in the chat. Um, if you want to look at a little bit of my personal work, it's SusanKatzPhotography.com. Uh, but I spend most of my time uh, on my PhotoWings.org uh, website, and I made a couple of videos. Um, one is pr uh, very personal, so you might want to look at it. I think Can you tell everyone what your TED Talk is? Because they need to see those photos, too. Oh, well, it's, um, uh, it was TED University. And not all of those made it to the regular website, but mm. I adapted it from the one that we did uh, in our group. Uh, it was about um, how to be a better photographer, but the sneaky part was about caring about um, caring about saving your photos because it may be lost to the elements, uh, technology, or someone not caring. So that was kind of the, the thing of it. Thank you. Neil. Um, you got the coolest email. <laughs> well, the, thank you. The email <laughs> is galaxy at main.edu. And the website is nfcummins.ag-sites. That's Authors Guild. ag-sites.net. Thank you. Sarah. Uh, first, let me just say, Susie, these photos are beautiful. Thank you for sharing your website. I just pulled it up and flagged it for me to dig into later. Um, this was such a treat. Thank you all. Uh, I can be reached at sarah at valorperform.com. And then our website, if anyone's interested in checking out what we do at Valor Performance, it's just valorperform.com. So thank you for letting me join Ruth. This is a Thanks. Treat. And I hope you'll come back again. Dwayne Allen Thomas, you just muted yourself. Uh, yeah, there was uh, another phone ringing in the background. I'm sorry. Sorry. About that. <laughs> All right, so you can reach me at hotdogs.com. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> He's obsessed right. with hot dogs. dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you can go with uh, equalresults.com instead. Thank you. All right. Donna. Hi. Um, you can find us at eldera.ai. Um, and in particular, if you are over 60 and want to mentor cute kids from around the world, sign up. And I am Donna at Eldera.ai. Thanks. And I think last time um, we, we posted, and I'm hoping you got a lot of traffic because a lot of people were interested. And I know there are a lot of people, a lot of kids who are looking for mentors. So we still have a, about 100 families now in waitlist. We went from 150 to 100, so we're doing good. Great. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Thank you. Liana. Uh, you can reach me. The best way to uh, connect with me is betheoffer.com. So when you go to betheoffer.com, you'll receive a little mini video series, which is based on my teachings, because I believe you are the masterpiece. Every human being is a masterpiece. And the video series shows you what my work is based on. It was created about 40 years ago, and it is more valid today than it was then. And do you and want to tell I'll everyone open. about the Sunday event? Is that open? Yeah, so the Sunday event um, is open to anyone who wants to join. It's a three-hour deep dive into this conversation. And um, it's, it's a pretty powerful concept. So I'm going to be posting it on LinkedIn just so that you have the exact link to go to. To sign up, we want to make sure that um, you're prepped and ready. We want to make sure that you get the emails because uh, it's not going to be an open link. So just uh, connect with me at liana, liana at image therapists with an S at the end dot com. Liana, L-I-A-N-A -A at image, I-M-A-G-E, and then therapist, like the therapist, only plural with an S at the end dot com. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Dr. Susan. You can, re excuse me, reach me directly at Dr. Susan Burnstone at Gmail, S-U-S-A-N-B-I-R-N-E-S-T-O-N-E -S -S -E at gmail.com. Or you can just plug in my name in Google and lots of different things come up. My show, my website, lots of stuff. And I believe that Debbie's posting them on Facebook as well. So 
Thank you again, Ruth. This has been Thank great you. for everybody. And Susan's the reason we're all so tight because for all of us who met at this conference since the pandemic began, she's been hosting these Saturday night happy hours for us, which is where we really got to know each other. So thank you for that. It's been great. Thank you for all. Thank you all for coming. And it's been wonderful getting to know everybody. Yes. Dr. Bruce Wiley. So I've always wanted to email the galaxy. So now I, I, I can actually email the galaxy. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, Bruce Wiley, uh, BruceWiley.com, or you can Google Bruce Wiley, and the way to remember it is Bruce Lee, why not? Uh, so if you do just Bruce Lee Google search, then you'll get lots of martial arts stuff. So include the why. Great. Thank you. Dr. Charlie Camarda. Charles.j.camarda at gmail.com or charlie at epiceducationfoundation.org. Beautiful. Welcome back to Earth, Charlie. <laughs> Jana Marie Tutalman. Yes, it is uh, crystal clear technique at gmail.com. Beautiful. And I am ruthgotian.com. It's just my name, R U T H G O T I A N, on all the social media platforms. It's just my name. And I do want to thank very, very much. Dr. Debbie Heiser and the Mentor Project for hosting us each and every week and bringing this amazing group together. I hope all of you guys will join next week. We are going to continue the conversation. Um, maybe we'll talk about gratitude. What do you guys think? Do we touch on that? Love it, love it, love it, love it. <laughs> all right, we will start talking about, we'll kick off the conversation with gratitude. And then, you know, as it happens every week, we don't even know where we're going to end up. We start with something. And then this is what happens when you bring these high achievers together from different industries. We just feed off each other and learn from each other. So everyone, thank you very much. Good night. Bye. <laughs>